uh, scan your phone over the QR code and fill out that Connect card, and that will help us to know to reach out to you and answer any questions you have. All right, guys, let's have a great morning. In just a couple of minutes, the worship team will be out to get us rolling. It is so good to be with you. Hey, if we haven't met, my name's Nicole. I am the worship director around here, still relatively new. So if we haven't met, feel free to pull me aside and give me a high five or I dare say a hug. I'm a little hug shy every now and then. And introduce yourself because I would love to get to know you. Hey, would you go ahead and stand with us if you are able? There's something special about the posture that we choose. And I think a lot of times in order for us to come into the presence of God, a lot of times we must lead ourselves, our minds, our hearts, our souls, our very bodies into the presence of the King. Because if we truly believe that there is a King in our midst, I know we don't have kings or queens like in America, but if the Queen or the King, now King, was to step into this room, I think the, the least we would do is first stand. After that, we might sit or we might bow. There's a lot of other things beyond that, but the first posture is to get our souls to stand to him. And I think the other place that we start is to set our minds, our hearts, and our souls intentionally on the word of God, on the word of God, which has uh, become alive to us because of what Jesus did on the cross and now has given us the Holy Spirit. So let us fix our eyes, our minds on this word that comes from Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him, this is Jesus we're talking about, the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's lift him up now with loud voices.
I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me. Wow. 
you know about a couple of things that are super important within our Christ Center community. One of them is we are launching groups. So you can go to ChristCenterCashmere.com and you can find all of the spring groups that are being offered and get registered and signed up uh, to join a group this spring. And then second, we want to let you know Easter is coming up March 31st, two services, 9 and 11. And a part of those services are going to be baptisms. And if you would like to get baptized or know more about what baptism is, you can go to ChristCenterCashmere.com, and we are offering a class that you can take that will tell you more about baptism. Thanks, you guys. Good morning, Christ Center. How are you today? Was worship amazing or was that just me? I mean, that was awesome. You guys got into it. I loved it. Well, this morning's message is brought to you by DayQuil. So just, uh, you know, just so you're aware, uh, the staff's been battling a little bit of the bug lately. So uh, if we haven't met, my name's Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Center. 
And we're just so honored you're here today. If you're new, if this is your first time, welcome. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. We don't take it for granted that you'd spend a few moments with us today. Uh, super excited. Excited about today's message, which is simply called Dream. Turn to your neighbor and say, Dream. Turn to your other neighbor and say, You dream too. We're talking about dreams today. If you uh, have your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 2. That's going to be ground zero for us today. We're going to take a look at a story. We're going to take it actually a look at some world-class dreamers. You know, God spoke to a lot of people through dreams. Uh, he challenged people through dreams. Uh, as a matter of fact, he spoke to Joseph in a dream that he was not supposed to return back to Nazareth, but to actually escape into Egypt. God spoke to the other Joseph in a dream as well. It was a dream that the Pharaoh had, and Joseph was able to interpret that dream. God spoke to Daniel through a dream. As a matter of fact, it says in Acts that in the end times, in the end of days, that all generations will dream dreams and have visions. And I am praying for you individually that you have dreams, that God gives you dreams. I believe you do dream. I believe you dream about your families and what they could be. I believe you dream about your future and what it could be. I believe you dream about how your spiritual walk would look. I believe you dream about how you can connect with your neighbor. Um, but we also dream collectively. We dream as a church. And, and I think we have a lot of dreams. We have a huge dream. And the dream is that we would lead people to Jesus and make disciples. That's our dream. That's our dream in a nutshell. We have some values that go along with that. Serving and community spending time with God, following Jesus, living generously. So we dream individually, we dream collectively. There's a great quote, it says, What we dream alone remains a dream. What we dream with others can become reality. <clears throat> I, I think there's some power in dreaming together. And that's what I'm praying for as a church, that we are mission-focused <coughs> of leading people to Jesus and making disciples. And I pray that we continue to be people of dreams, that we would allow God to speak to us and encourage us and give us dreams. And this morning, we're going to look at what I believe are some world-class dreamers. Uh, it was a small team, actually, of dreamers in Mark chapter 2 that we're going to look at today. So let's just take a look at the scriptures and see what it says about this, this world-class dreaming team. And again, he entered Capernaum. Why does it say again? Because he often went to Capernaum. It's actually where Peter lived, one of his disciples. And after some days, it was heard that he was in where? The house. It doesn't say a house. It says the house. Uh, and it is believed by most scholars that the house was actually Peter's house, which he frequented often. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to, the, to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, 
take your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took up his bed, and he went out in the presence of all of them, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. True dreamers, point number one, true dreamers have the right perspective. They have the right perspective. If you want to be a true dreamer, then it has to start with a good foundation. You have to believe that God is good. And when things are going rough, when things are going difficult, um, it's hard to have that perspective. Sometimes it's a challenge to believe that God is good when things are bad. But you have to have the right perspective. You have to believe that God is always at work, even when things are difficult. Let's see what the scripture says. Remember, it says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Have you ever carried someone? Now, I worked on an ambulance, and so we carried people a lot of times. And I happened to work on two passes, uh, Blewett Pass and Stevens Pass. And so there were several occasions where we had to carry people um, with lots of snow up and down hills, through driveways. And after a while, it gets very difficult to carry. You start to lose your balance. Your hand gets weak because you've been carrying them for so long. You want to set them down and switch sides. But they had a mission. These dreamers had a mission. They had a perspective. And the perspective was, if we can just get them to Jesus, it'll be okay. You see, it is not what a person does that determines whether their work, life, or dreams are secular or sacred. It is why they do them. It's why they do them. A person's perspective is everything. If a person chooses to live and dream as unto the Lord, they can do no common thing. So when, you are, when you're at work and you're dreaming about what your work environment could be, when you're at home and you're dreaming about what your family could be, when you're in your neighborhoods and you're dreaming about what your neighborhood could be, when you're in your church and believing about what your church could be, and you might think it's just a common thing, but if your perspective is, I'm taking God into this place, I'm shining his light out, the Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness and we are made in the image of God. We are light bearers. If when we go into those places, we have the perspective that we can make a change by his spirit, we can do no common thing. Even some of the most basic things that you do can be sacred when they're done with the right perspective. They clearly loved this man. Why else? We, we don't know how far that, it, that they had to travel to take this man to get to Jesus. We don't know if it was, you know, 10, 10 blocks. We don't know if it was 10 miles. We just know that they carried him there. They wanted to see him healed. There was a love for him, and they believed if they could get him to Jesus, then they would be rewarded for it, that he could heal him. And when Matthew tells this same story, he doesn't mention the part about them tearing off the roof. Now, why do you think that is? Why does Matthew not mention, he just mentions the healing? But why in Mark does it mention that, the, that they went up and came through the roof? You see, Mark was one of Peter's disciples. And whose house was it that they were in? Peter's house. 
That's why Matthew remembers the healing. Peter remembers the hole in the roof. Because if you, if it was your house and all of a sudden there's, you know, light coming where light shouldn't be coming from and pieces of debris hitting you on the head, you're going to say, hey, this is my house. I've got to sleep here tonight. All of you are going to go home, but this is my bedroom. And so he remembered the hole in the roof. Their perspective was, if we could just get him to Jesus. Carry this man all this way. We get there. It's crowded. We can't even get near the door. What are we going to do? Houses in that time had stairways to the roof. There were cross beams on the roof, and they would... Um, they would have a thatched roof that went across the cross beams, and then they would have three to four inches of uh, clay, mud, that they would put on top of the thatching, and it would harden like concrete. And oftentimes, to get fresh air, because many times they kept their animals in the house, they would go up to the roof or to cool down in the evening. They would go to the roof. So it was common for people to have stairs that led to the roof. And so these guys get there, and they know that they've got to get him to Jesus, but they can't get through the door. And so they go, wait a minute. Let's go to the roof. And then all of a sudden, they're breaking through this roof. You know, is your perspective is your perspective when it relates to your family, when it relates to the difficult difficulty you're in, is it born out of love and faith? When you're going through the trial that you're going through right now and you're tempted to stop dreaming? You know, Randy, we have a team huddle in the morning that we get together and we just pray for the service, pray for each other. And one of our board members, Randy, made the comment that you have to cling to hope. It's not just something you just have, but you have to cling to it. And I thought that's such wisdom. Is your perspective clinging to hope? Does it have faith? Is it born out of love? His friends got him to Jesus. They found a way to get him there. And so do we need to have that same perspective in our lives as they had in their lives. His friends got him to Jesus. His friends got him forgiven, but his haters got him healed. Did you hear that? You see, the men carrying him got him forgiven, because what did Jesus do first? He, he saw their faith. It says, wow. He goes, the, he was amazed at their faith. Here they are, breaking through Peter's, and you know Jesus is chuckling, don't you? Don't you know he's chuckling, knowing what Peter's thinking? And you know Peter's thinking and probably saying a few things. And yet their faith, and we don't know, we, we don't know if it was a wide hole where they, ha, they let him down, you know, like, you know, horizontal, or if they just let him down vertical. We don't know how big the hole was, but it was big enough that he fit through it. And he gets down there, and they're finally thinking, we got him to Jesus. Their perspective was good. And then what does Jesus say? Does he heal him? No. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. And if you're the guy that's been carrying him for all this time, you walk him up the roof, you break through the tile, you get him to Jesus, aren't you a little bit disappointed that he didn't, for, didn't heal him? Jesus, if we had wanted his sins forgiven, you know, We'd have, we, he's paralyzed. We, we want him healed. But instead, Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven you. But the haters, the religious leaders, 
started thinking, who is this guy that forgives sins? No one can forgive sins but God alone. And in this day and age, you believe that if someone was paralyzed, it was because they had sinned. Either they had sinned or their parents had sinned. But there was sin wrapped around this guy. And so right out of the gate, Jesus is saying, your sins are forgiven. That's not, that's not the issue. He was still paralyzed after his sins were forgiven. But Jesus said, because he knew what they were thinking, he said, but so that you know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive and the power to heal, take up your mat and go home. Healing was not on Jesus' agenda for the day. Preaching was on Jesus' agenda for the day. What was he doing? What was he doing when they showed up? He was preaching the word. There's no mention of him healing anyone. The four men that carried him got him forgiven, but his haters got him healed. And sometimes in our lives, there are people that are haters, almost enemies. They're not looking out for your best interest. And sometimes we're tempted to believe that we just need to get them out of our lives and, you know, God bless them, but I want nothing to do with them. And yet sometimes those people have more to do with influencing you than the lovers. Some of the people that have been probably my harshest critics or my worst enemies have become my greatest source of growth. And just because you're struggling with someone right now doesn't mean that God can't even use them. Sometimes you need a perspective change. That God can use anyone or anything to accomplish his purpose in your life. And so if you're dealing with that right now, you're dealing with that person that's, that's maybe frustrating you so badly, understand that God might be using them to grow you. And just say, God, I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to receive. And have an open heart that God can use anyone or anything to teach us. Have the right perspective. Number two, true deemer, dreamers are wit people. Wit. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I like to say it like this. True dreamers buy a third class ticket. At our kickoff last fall, I told you about the Concord Stagecoach Company. Some of you may not have been here. But in the 1800s, the Concord Stage Company was, uh, they would take you across country in this stage. And you could buy three tickets. You could buy a first class ticket, a second class ticket, or a third class ticket. First class ticket meant that if the coach got stuck, that you get to stay on the coach and you're fed and you're pampered. You don't even have to leave. You just stay on there. If you buy a second class ticket, you have to get out and wait while the coach is freed from whatever's making it stuck. But if you buy a third class ticket, it means when it gets stuck, you get out and you push. World class dreamers buy a third class ticket. They're willing to push. The dream comes with much effort. I love what T.E. Lawrence says. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake up in the day to find it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they act out their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. Scripture says, then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And then when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And so when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So let's recap. 
Four guys carry this man to Jesus. We don't know how far they had to carry him. Then they had to find a way to get him to Jesus, so they had to go up on the roof, which had to take a lot of work. How many of you were ever here for Ridge to River way back in the day? Anyone ever do Ridge to River way back in the day? Remember, you would do whatever leg you had to do, and then the very last half mile, you had to carry portage that canoe the whole half mile, running with other people portaging that canoe at the same time. Did anyone else want to throw up during that last half mile? I would have much rather done my event four or five times rather than doing that last half mile with that canoe. It's brutal. They carried him however long they had to carry him, took him up on the roof, had to break through basically concrete by the time this thing had been baked, but they were not going to give up. They refused to give up. Most people would have just said, well, Jesus isn't accepting any more people today. Sorry. We're not going to stay. We're going to take you home. But they didn't. They were make-it-happen people. So they cut a hole in the roof, and they let down the bed in front of Jesus. They were wit people, whatever it takes. Turn to your neighbor and say, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And sometimes you just have to go, to your roof, go through the roof. Turn to your other neighbor and say, hey, go through the roof. Go through the roof. Sometimes you just have to go through the roof. And what did it take? What did it take for them to go through the roof? They had to get past obstacles and focus on possibilities, right? Because the obstacle was clear. They couldn't get to Jesus, so they had to focus on the only possible solution. Okay, well, there's a stairwell. We can get, they focus on the possibilities. And sometimes you get so focused How many of you do this? I am so guilty of this. I did it last week. I got so focused on the obstacle that I couldn't see or imagine any possibilities. Sometimes it's not even a challenge of our faith. It's a challenge of our imagination to see that God can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. God can do more than we can imagine. And whatever you're going through right now, whatever dream you think that is over, don't give up. Hold on to hope. Believe that God can do more than your mind can imagine. Be wit people, whatever it takes. They had to get through that roof. And sometimes, sometimes that roof, let's face it, is a second door. It, it, it became for them a second door. Door number two, you know, uh, we have door number one, door number two, and door number three. Well, door number no, one's not working, so I'm going to go to door number two. And that's what they did. They went to door number two. My last point is this. Sometimes dreams come as disguises. Sometimes they're just disguised. Have you ever had a dream and you thought it was over and then God did something amazing through what you thought was the end? See, that that first door was only the beginning. Who would have thought that there was a door hidden in that roof? Who would have thought there was a snake hidden in Moses' staff? Who would have thought that there was a crown hidden in Joseph's prison? Who would have thought there was the defeat of the Philistine army hidden in a sling and a rock? Who would have thought there was a divine rescue in a lion's den? Who would have thought there was deliverance of Nineveh hidden in the belly of a whale? Who would have thought that there was divinity hidden in a stable in Bethlehem? Who would have thought? On and on and on the Bible goes where dreams are disguised 
as staffs or slings and stones or roofs. But God can do more than we can imagine according to the power that is at work within us. I would have been tempted to believe, okay, well, I tried. Packed house. Not these four. You know, maybe the door that you're trying to get through right now, maybe that's not your door. Maybe the relationship you're in that you think is a dead end, maybe it's because that's not your door. Your door is higher. Maybe the job that you've just been let go from, you think, well, that was my door, but maybe that's not your door. Maybe your door is higher. Maybe the financial situation that you're coming to right now that seems hopeless, you thought that was your door, but that's not your door. Your door is higher. It's disguised. God is never late, but seldom early. And I know that in this room there are people going through some struggles and you feel like your door is locked. I'm here to remind you this morning that your door is higher than what you could have imagined. You see, resurrection always comes disguised as death. Did you hear that? Resurrection always comes disguised as death. But you will never receive the resurrection power of Jesus until you first die, until you surrender, until you let it go, until you trust, until you have the right perspective. doesn't mean that God's not going to require some things from you. You're going to have to be with people, but you do have to say, God, you lead the dance. I surrender to you. This morning... Maybe you're experiencing a death of some sort. Uh, so many kinds of deaths. Could be a literal illness. Could be a relationship. It could be a, a work situation. It could be finances. It could, so many things. Exhaustion. Could be depression, discouragement. I'm here to remind you this morning, it's not the end. That door's locked for a reason because your door is higher. But God's waiting for you to surrender to trust him. This morning, will you just bow your heads wherever you're at? Really, the action step this morning is just saying, God, I surrender. I trust you. I trust you to do more than I could ever imagine. And for some of you, that's a leap of faith today because you can't even imagine how God could get you out of this. But if you would be so inclined just to open your hands up to the Lord and say to him, God, I believe my door is higher. I believe that you are in this. I believe that you are guiding me. And I put my complete trust in you. I surrender to you. Just let go. And trust that he's going to be with you. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to strategize three weeks, five weeks, seven weeks from now. In this moment, oh, there may become a time where you have to you have to think through some things, but for now, would you just say, Lord, lead me. I trust you. I surrender to you. I know you have my best in your heart. And would you just receive this this morning? Your heavenly Father loves you so much. There's not a person in this room that God does not love in a, a way that we cannot even fathom. Who is on your mat?
I know it's March Madness, but what if we called it March Madness? Okay, that was corny. I'm sorry I had to do it. But what if God has placed someone on your mat, someone in your life, that even now as I say that, that that face comes to your mind? Who is on your mat? Don't get so caught up and entangled with this life that you forget what your mission is. Our mission is to lead people to Jesus and make disciples. That's it. That was Jesus' last words before he ascended. He says, go do it. So all of us should have mats with people on them. So my question is, who's on your mat? And what are you willing to do to get them to Jesus? Lord, we love you. We thank you. We trust you. God, would you just show us how? Give us a wit attitude by your spirit. Give us the right perspective. And Lord, help us to trust you even when our dreams are disguised. And God, help us to be faithful to carry some paralytics to you, Jesus. Those who need to have said to them, my son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Empower us now by your spirit in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen.
the Lord is amazing. Oh, I just feel every Sunday, you guys, gathering with you, I feel so blessed. I'm Stephanie. Uh, you already know that. You saw the videos twice this morning. Um, I just want to share a couple with, things with you as we get ready to head out and finish up our service. Um, I want to invite you all to stick around for our annual business meeting. Now, I know that in this room, there are people that love admin, love organization, love details, and are like, yeah. And then there's people like, meetings? No, thank you. Why would I do that? But I want to encourage you. We call this meeting that we have once a year the huddle. And we do it because we call it the huddle because we're a team. And we're all working together. We're all the body of Christ. And so we all come together and do our part to fulfill the mission that Jesus left for us. Uh, so at this huddle, we will be doing some things that might interest you and might, um, you might want to stick around for. First of all, we have a through the year video, which is always super fun just to remember the past year, to review when you're on a team. A lot of times you'll review the game, see how it went, you know, see what we could do better next year. And so we're going to have a review uh, through video. We're going to have a talk about our upcoming events and how those are strategic to our mission we're going to honor some of the men who have served so faithfully at this church, who have been on our board. We're going to take some time to honor them. And I think it's really valuable for our whole body, if you can be here, to be here and to be a part of honoring the work that they've done so that we can all enjoy what we, what we enjoy as a faith community. Um, we're also going to vote on some new members. And then we're going to have a testimony um, from a couple of Christ Center attendees. And that, that testimony speaks to our mission, to what we're all about and why we do this. So that is it. You don't want to miss that. So that's kind of what the huddle is all about. Um, we are going to do a 15-minute, like, end the service and then start the huddle. So the huddle will start right at 11.15. Uh, whether you are a member or not, you are invited to stay. If you have kiddos, what we're going to encourage you to do is just check in with your kids in their classrooms. Um, some of the kids, we're going to, I think, um, go down to two, maybe three classrooms instead of the normal four. And so you might want to just check in and make sure your kids are in the right place for huddle time. And they will have snacks upstairs. During that transition, we're going to have snacks here for everybody else, so you can grab a plate of snacks. We also encourage you that if you are a member, um, over here on the ta tables, we have letters. I think it's A through L. Thank you. Someone, someone knew I was going to forget that. A through L, last name over here. You can pick up your ballot during the 15-minute transition. And then K through Z over here, you can pick up your ballot. If you are not sure, am I a member? Oh, shoot, I want to be a member. I just forgot to fill out the form. Um, I want to be a part of that. You can come right up here, and Janice Dickens and Juan will be up here, and they will help you sort through that and figure out um, how we can get you involved in the membership part of Christ Center. So make sure to pick up your ballots during that 15-minute break, and then just take them back to your chair. Uh, and then Steve will... Um, explain what to do with those later. Also on the table there are um, Christ Center pamphlets, which are really great. They kind of go through the year in pictures. They tell about our mission and our vision and our values. So pick up one of those. Those are just for your benefit. Also the financials are on the table. So you can pick up a, one of those and uh, we will discuss those in the huddle time together. Go over our financials. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I got everything. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I think that's it. Nobody's yelling at me, so that's a good sign. Uh, all right, you guys. Well, thank you so much for attending. And please, please, if you are able, stick around. Uh, this is unlike any other business meeting you've ever been to. We have a lot of fun, and we really enjoy it. And we encourage you to find out a little more about Christ Center. All right, have a great week, you guys. We'll talk soon. Two.